Hi, my name is Aaron Lacey. I'm the chair of the higher education practice at Thompson Coburn LLP, and you are listening to Title IX Appeals, the last in our Title IX training series. Uh, we are so pleased you're with us today, and um, if you've been listening to all the prior sessions, this is six of six. Congratulations, because you've gotten through a lot of training, and we've got another good discussion for you today. I can also promise you that it's going to be the shortest of the six, so uh, if you've made it this far, you're almost uh, to the end. For those who don't know, Thompson Coburn is a law firm uh, headquartered in the Midwest. Uh, we're pretty big. We've got offices around the country, and we have a higher education practice, and the folks you see on your screen right now, these are lawyers who either work with higher education some of the time or in many cases all of the time. I myself spend 100% of my day working with colleges and universities on a range of matters and the practice uh, broadly many of these folks work on uh, allegations or issues involving discrimination uh, on the basis of sex or race or disability or some other protected class. Uh, the purpose of this training series is to assist institutions in complying with the new Title IX rule that becomes effective August 14th, 2020. Pursuant to that rule, institutions of higher education uh, are supposed to provide training for all the individuals who will be participating in, uh, and I mean the internal at the institution individuals who will be participating in and helping to administer the new formal complaint process. So we're talking about investigators and adjudicators and potentially appeal officers and advisors and others. Uh, not only are you required to train those folks, but you're also required to post that training to your external website that you use all of your training materials. So we understand, given the pandemic in particular right now, that it is hard to identify or may be hard to identify resources and deploy those and make them available uh, to these various individuals. And that's why we created this series. Uh, to be clear, we are very happy for you to post it to your external website or to use it at your discretion uh, now and in the future. And if you would like custom training, this is foundational training. There's a lot to it. So we do have six sessions and we go through a lot. But if you'd like custom training on your policies, or if you'd like to do some sort of hearing simulation or investigation simulation, things along those lines, give us a call because we, uh, we help institutions with those types of trainings as well. I mentioned earlier, this is our training series layout. It consists of six modules in its entirety, and you are watching the final module on appeals. Um, the session today will have uh, just a few parts. This is our syllabus. You see this in every one of our sessions, and we've got, I guess it's five different uh, uh, topics to hit on the syllabus. I'll go through the first one, the formal complaint framework fairly quickly. I do that at the beginning of every session, just uh, to get people, as I like to say, sort of get your mind right so you remember where we are and things. And then our two presenters, uh, we have Judge Schalbach and Scott Goldschmidt as well, and they'll be uh, working through these various topics. Uh, I mentioned Judge Shaw. He was in our prior session on hearings uh, as a trial judge in the state of Missouri. He oversaw literally hundreds of hearings, and he also sat for uh, several years on the Missouri Court of Appeals. So this gentleman is uh, a professional adjudicator in every sense. And if you went through the hearing, if you haven't heard the hearing session, I, I hope you'll go back and listen to it because it was really good. Um, and he brought that sort of experience and perspective of a career adjudicator. If you are someone tasked with uh, managing Title IX hearings or appeals, uh, these will be sessions you wanna listen into. So we have the Honorable Judge Shaw and we have the estimable uh, Scott Goldschmidt, former Deputy General Counsel at Catholic University who's been present in all of our sessions. Scott, thank you so much for being back today uh, to you and Judge Shaw and for walking us through the appeals process. Um, right before you do that though, before I hand it over to Scott, just a reminder, uh, the new rules. So we talk about Title IX, the statute, which uh, broadly prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex at institutions of higher education. And anytime an institution gets a complaint or an allegation of discrimination on the basis of sex, they've got to have a process for working through that. But keep in mind, that could be any type of allegation, not just sexual harassment. So you could be dealing with um, claims that uh, there was discrimination in the context of housing or admissions or counseling anything along those lines, athletics, an institution would have a process in place and need to respond. The new rule is really focused on what institutions should do if they get a complaint of what we're calling Title IX sexual harassment. In the very first of our sessions, Scott went through this definition under the new law of sexual harassment. And if you get an allegation of sexual harassment that satisfies that definition, then there are obligations uh, under the new rule. Even more specifically, if you get a formal complaint of Title IX sexual harassment, and that's the orange box here, that's the, 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 the core of our concern. Uh, if you get a formal complaint that there's a lot, then there is a lot you have to do. And that's really what this new training series is focused on. And, and it's what the new rule is focused on. 
we've got the definition of formal complaint here. We're talking about a, a written complaint that you receive either from the complainant or Title IX coordinator that, that alleges sexual harassment and is seeking an investigation. So it's got to be in writing. It needs to be signed. It could be electronic or, or hard copy, but, but either way, it's got to be in writing. If you get that formal complaint, though, then you have to initiate your formal complaint process. And that's where all this machinery sort of comes into place. Um, and that's, again, what the new rule is primarily focused on. And you can see our series, these are all the different elements of the formal complaint process that are laid out in the new rule. And our series, training series, is largely focused on walking through these elements. And as I noted before, you're almost at the very end. We did record keeping in the first session. We tied it in. So uh, in a sense, appeals is actually the end of the line here, uh, at least for our training. So with all of that having been said, I'm delighted to turn it over uh, to Mr. Scott Goldschmidt. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, and uh, I think let's just dive into to a few key concepts uh, with appeals. Um, mm -hmm. So first, we'll just kind of go over uh, the, the general overviews uh, requirements of the regulations. And then we'll, um, we'll turn to Judge Shaw for some of his, uh, his opinion and, and, uh, and uh, experience based on uh, actually doing a lot of these. Um, so first, so key concepts uh, with appeals. So schools must offer both parties an appeal um, for one, the determination regarding responsibility. So if you get to a, a formal hearing and adjudication and there is a determination on responsibility, that is one time an appeal must be offered. Uh, the second time an appeal must be offered is regarding the school's dismissal of a formal complaint or any allegations herein. Now we've discussed this in more detail in the formal uh, complaint module, but remember there are uh, points before a formal adjudication where the school either may or must dismiss a formal complaint. And this is another point where uh, an individual has, a, the school has to afford an option to appeal. Um, schools have to implement their appeal procedures equally for both parties. Uh, we're going to go over the basics of what the, the rule requires, the, the floor, but um, to the extent that there are any additional requirements or, um, or uh, inputs in, in their in procedures, they have to be applied equally. Schools must notify the other party in writing when an appeal is filed, and, and schools must ensure that the appeal officers, not the hearing coordinator, investigator, I'm sorry, not the adjudicator, the investigator, or Title IX coordinator. And we'll go into a little more detail uh, about uh, maybe people that might be good serving as appeal officers. Uh, in addition, uh, schools must ensure the appeal officers received required training. We'll explain uh, what that required training is according to the, the regulation. Um, schools and institutions must give both parties reasonable, equal opportunities su to submit a written statement in support of or challenging the outcome. Um, and, and that we'll discuss uh, the schools have to issue a written decision describing the result. So after the appeal officer uh, hears the, reads the appeals and both parties have had a chance to, to, to state their case, uh, there needs to be a written decision describing the results and the, the decision of the appeal officer. And that decision needs to be provided simultaneously to both parties. Uh, so let's turn to, to what, what can you appeal on? Um, so the statute, the, uh, sorry, excuse me, the regulations uh, have three um, applicable bases for appeal. So the first that you, the schools must, uh, must include is a procedural irregularity that affected the outcome. The second is new evidence that was not reasonably available at the time the determination or dismissal was made and could affect the outcome. And third, the Title IX coordinator or investigator or adjudicator had a conflict of interest or bias that affected the outcome. So what's important to note here is these are fairly specific bases for appeal. The department's not saying that if one party is dissatisfied with the outcome or they, they just generally think that something could have gone better their way, they could appeal that. Uh, the actual appeal needs to be based on one of these three narrow specific outcomes. Um, that being said, the department also makes clear that a school can offer other appeal grounds equally to both parties. So by, uh, by their process, they can say, I have, I have appeal rights four, five, and six, and I'm gonna make them available equally to both parties. But even if the school decides to add additional um, bases of appeal, 
it doesn't mean that the uh, that there's a general um, right to appeal. Uh, you have to be really kind of focused and based on these specific grounds and the appeal that the complainant or respondent submits needs to explain um, why one of these uh, bases is effective. Um, so Judge Shaw, let me, let me kick it to you for, for our first question here. Um, so we just went over the three mandatory bases of appeal in the regulations. Um, I didn't see anything about severity or proportionality um, of a sanction. Is that an appropriate basis for appeal under these rules? Well, it could be if the um, recipient decides to make it a basis for an appeal. I mean, the only, the three you pointed out are the only ones that are uh, mandatory. But um, I would suggest that uh, severity or proportionality of sanctions may be an appropriate basis, but of course the recipient has to state that it is and offer it to both parties. Makes sense. Um, and then what about the party just um, requesting an appeal because of, of general dissatisfaction with the result? Well, somebody is going to be dissatisfied no matter what the result is. So no, you can't appeal just because you're dissatisfied. It must meet one of the three criteria you just talked about, Scott, or any additional ones the recipient chooses to implement. And if, if a hearing officer received an appeal uh, based on just general dissatisfaction, um, how, how, would they, how would they adjust that? I'm sure you've, uh, as in your, in your previous career, have, have had plenty of those. How, how would you address something where an individual made an appeal based on a ground that was not specified as permitted by your regulations? That's what would the court would say to us, is that uh, the appeal is denied because it was not based upon a ground specified and permitted. So, so what about this? Uh, is, you're not satisfied with the appeal officer's um, decision. Uh, who do you appeal that to? <laughs> you, you, well, you have the right to file a lawsuit, but your appeal process is done. Uh, and, you know, I think, you know, I guess uh, circling back just a little bit, I think people often feel, uh, lay people often feel that an appeal is a do-over. It's not a do-over. I mean, there are certain limited basis upon which you can appeal, and appeals are not unlimited. Uh, you know, the process, you, you've often heard justice delayed, is justice denied. I mean, the process must come to an end, must come to a conclusion for the sake of all parties concerned. And so there is one appeal, and if uh, a party is dissatisfied with that appeal, then they can file a lawsuit. All right, let's move on to, to talk about drafting appeal decisions. So, so we talked in the previous couple slides about what applicable bases and, and what happens when uh, someone files a uh, appeal that maybe doesn't meet one of those bases, but, but now let's talk about when someone files a proper appeal. Uh, it, it, it meets one of the bases in your procedure, uh, and you have, you have it in front of you, and you kind of have to, to go about uh, evaluating the, the facts and the decisions. Um, Judge Shaw, what, what are some things that appeal officers can, can consider as they're reviewing appeals and ultimately drafting those decisions? Well, as, as you've indicated, Scott, it, it has to be based, the appeal has to be based upon one of the applicable grounds. And, and once that determination is made, that is, the appeal is uh, made on an appropriate procedural ground, then what are the allegations there? And of course, the, uh, the appeal officer must have an open mind about it and not, uh, you know, give any particular weight to one side or the other and uh, objectively make a determination as to whether or not those grounds for appeal have been established. Now, the one thing, of course, that I think um, the uh, appeal officer is going to have to give deference on, and that is on matters of credibility, because the appeal officer will not be considering the witnesses again. The appeal officer, if it is, if the, um, if the hearing officer makes a determination that one witness was more credible and believable than another witness, or that the witnesses were equally credible on certain points, then there's no way that uh, 
the appeal officer can find differently because the appeal officer will not have a duel. They won't hear the witness. They will just look at these bases that have been offered to them. But otherwise, uh, I don't think that there should be any particular deference one way or another about the validity of the uh, finding by the hearing officer and that the appeal should be considered with an open mind and objectively. So, so kind of going off of that, what, what facts, what uh, documents would, would you expect a hearing officer to have in front of them? And, and what would you, if you were a hearing officer, what, what would you want to, to have in order to make your, uh, your, your review, your decision? A hearing officer should have each and everything, I mean, the appeals officer appeals should officer. Thank have everything you. that the hearing officer had. Uh, transcript, documents, uh, statements, anything that was considered by the um, hearing officer, as well as any evidence or documents that may have been rejected in case there was some procedural irregularity with regard to a relevance determination. So uh, they would have to consider the whole record to appropriately consider the appeal. Judge let me let me move back a little bit. Um, we, we talked about the, the appeal bases, uh, and, and the three bases by the department were procedural irregularities, new evidence not available, and conflict of interest or bias. And each caveat is, is at the end of each at individual point, it's, it's that they have to have affected the outcome of the proceeding. Yeah. Um, what, what, do, what does that mean to you in terms of uh, if, you, if you get an appeal uh, based on one of these factors that it affected the outcome? Well, let's say, you know, now of course it has to be determined on a case by case basis and, and according to the facts uh, and evidence that was presented in each case. But if this procedural irregularity or new evidence had been cured at the time of the hearing, if this evidence, for instance, that had been excluded would have been allowed in, if this uh, new evidence that was not reasonably available was available to the hearing officer, was that evidence of such weight and of significance, materiality and relevance that it would have changed the outcome or might have changed the outcome. One of the things that I think the, uh, the hearing officer and of course the appeal officer considered uh, is whether there was an appearance of impropriety and whether um, reasonable minds would conclude that this evidence, whether excluded evidence or newly discovered evidence might have affected the outcome. The harder call can sometimes be uh, whether or not there was a conflict of interest or bias. And I think that that is why the hearing officer has to be very careful about is there even an appearance that a social relationship or a professional relationship might have affected uh, either the hearing officer or an investigator in the case. And of course, those things should have been cured at the hearing because you may find yourself, if there is even the appearance that there is a possibility that a conflict of interest or bias could have affected the outcome, you may have a problem with the perception that this was not a fair hearing. And the uh, appeals officer may be in a position to say, well, you know, I don't know. It's, it's hard to read minds. I don't know if this might have affected the outcome. Now, if the relationship is so attenuated, so distant, and uh, such that one can very reasonably say, okay, this could not possibly have made any difference. In a closer call, uh, I think the appeal officer may be forced to or, you know, offer a new hearing under those circumstances and send it back. So, but otherwise, I think it just has to be on a case-by-case -case basis, and the uh, appeals officer has to look at that evidence and make an objective determination as to whether or not they think it may have affected the outcome one way or the other. Just to button up this point, um, if, if the appeal officer thinks that it, it, it would not have affected the outcome, if they reasonably kind of say maybe there was a procedural irregularity, but it wouldn't affect the outcome, how, how would an officer uh, decide in that case? 
if if it would not have affected the outcome, then it cannot be the basis for uh, overturning the findings at the hearing. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Now I just wanted to, to button that up for, for, for yeah. my understanding. Um, sure. So so let's talk about, uh, you mentioned before, there's no appeal to the appeal, but you could, you could file a complaint with the Office of Civil Rights or you could file a lawsuit. Um, so I think all appeal officers have in the back of their head, this is a, this is a possibility. Um, what about, so I, I, in drafting an appeal, what can an appeal officer do to, to make it as um, defensible as possible in case it is ever reviewed by an administrative agency or, or a court at the time? Yes, well, you know, it's much like uh, the Court of Appeals does. I mean, you have to address each of the points on appeal, and it is the claims raised on appeal, and say why they either did or did not necessitate a new hearing or require that the findings at the hearing be affirmed. And the more succinct, the better. Thank you, Judge Shaw. Um, with that, I think that takes us to uh, some potential requirements or um, or uh, characteristics of, of, of good appeal officers. Uh, so I think this is uh, not an easy job along with being an adjudicator. Appeal officer is not an easy job. Um, so what, in your experience, what would be some, some good characteristics, some things to look for when an institution is deciding who they should make their appeal officer? Well, I, I think as we have discussed before that uh, the appeal officer should be someone uh, who has, I think, um, no conflict, no bias, and be of such a stature within the institution that uh, um, they lend a certain gravitas to, to the decision that they've made in the case. Um, I think it would be someone who has a reputation for being objective and thorough, uh, a detail-oriented person, understanding the process, and not afraid or concerned about any repercussions uh, based upon whatever their decision may be. Do you, do you think institutions need to look for a lawyer or someone with legal training to, to do this kind of uh, analysis? I don't think they should exclude lawyers, but I don't think that it's necessary to have lawyers. Okay, very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, so institutions, I think, uh, I think as, as Judge Shaw explained, um, potentially, I don't think you might want your, your president or, or CEO to be, to be hearing these appeals, but uh, maybe someone at the step below a vice presidential level uh, at the institution or someone kind of in charge of the process could be a, a good potential officer to, to hear. Scott, I'll, I'll actually go a step further and say, uh, you definitely do not want your president uh, or, or CEO or general counsel hearing these appeals. You definitely want someone who is um, not the foremost representative or legal counsel to the institution. Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, but and then I think that that brings us to the, the requirements for for an appeal officer. Um, so I think Judge Shaw gave us a great outline of what would be uh, expected in an ideal appeal officer, but in terms of the regulations, um, they explained that appeal officers must receive training on, on the following. So the definition of sexual harassment under the statute, the scope of the institution's program or activity, and, and that, as you may remember from a previous module, that's a defined term uh, about kind of where uh, the institution has authority to, to hear Title IX hearings, how to, how to conduct an investigation and grievance process, uh, so including hearings, appeals, informal resolutions is applicable, how to serve impartially, uh, including avoiding prejudgment of the facts at issue, conflict of interest and bias, and specific to your institution, uh, along with the scope, and any technology used at the, the live hearing, um, and on questions of relevance and evidence, um, including questions and evidence about a complainant's sexual predisposition or prior sexual behavior, and explaining that those are not relevant. Um, so Judge Shaw, let me throw this to you. Uh, you mentioned that it's important that appeal officers do not have conflicts of interest or, or bias before. 
Um, but what happens if, if an appeal officer does in a certain case or, or you suspect they do? Then uh, that appeal officer should be disqualified. Um, and, and as I said before, uh, you know, for the uh, viability of the process, it's essential that there not even be the appearance of impropriety in these proceedings. And so uh, much as, as we do in courts here, uh, we avoid even the appearance of impropriety. You know, sometimes it's that an, a, a judge might say, or in this instance, appeal officer or hearing officer might say, well, I don't have any bias or, you know, conflict. Of, I can set that aside kind of thing. But uh, it is an objective determination, you know. Is there a reason to believe that this relationship or this uh, situation is one in which parties may believe that there is a conflict or a bias there. And so to avoid even the appearance of an impropriety, it's best to avoid someone who has a potential conflict or bias. Perfect. And I think for that reason, um, institutions should, should make sure that they just don't have one person uh, that could be the only appeal officer or a system to, to designate that, that appeal officer for, um, for uh, in case they are on a, unavailable in case they have a conflict or in case the, the complaint is about the appeal officer. You don't want to have a, a policy mandating that person has to hear uh, the appeal of a case that might involve them. Yes, for sure. Um, and I think with that, Aaron, I'll, I'll flip it back to you for a discussion of resources. Thank you, Scott. Uh, and thank you to both you and Judge Shaw for another tremendous conversation today. Uh, so we'll walk through our resources one last time. Uh, first of all, I just want to remind everybody that the Office of Civil Rights has their blog, which is uh, where they have said they're going to post uh, guidance and interpretation on a go-forward basis relating to this new rule. Uh, so if you're counsel or coordinator, you'll definitely want to have the Office of Civil Rights blog in your browser. Uh, we have a comparison document that we created which shows the changes the new rule made to the existing regulatory framework. It should be located where you can find the slides for these presentations, hopefully near the videos. If you can't find it, just give me a, an email or otherwise a holler and I'll get it to you. Um, but if you're like me, it's very helpful to see the exact changes that were made to the regulation. Um, we have a higher education webinar series. We'd be delighted for you to join us. Uh, the webinars are all free and uh, you can also get them on demand after the fact, again, free if you weren't able to catch them. They're usually offered from August to May. We sort of track the academic year. We uh, cover a range of topics uh, and again, uh, we'd be delighted for you to check them out. Um, we also have a, a higher education blog where we write about a wide range of policy and regulatory issues that impact higher education. Uh, regucation is what we call that. Um, we've been writing a lot about the CARES Act recently, but we uh, cover topics of discrimination like Title IX also on a pretty regular basis. Um, Oh, let's see. And sometimes we have free tools that we make available and we encourage you, if you want to sign up for those, we can get, a, you can get our alerts. Uh, here's an example. We did a bar defense reporting guide. So uh, folks under another rule that became effective July 1 of 2020, uh, institutions have to report certain information to the Department of Ed and we put together a little guide to help them out with that kind of thing. Once again, all free and available. Just let us know if you'd like to sign up for these kinds of things or um, uh, otherwise have these resources uh, sent, sent to your inbox. Finally, uh, if you'll wait a few moments after this, you'll see uh, extended bios for Judge Shaw and Scott and myself, and at the end, our legal disclaimer that just reminds you that we are not your attorneys. Hey, this is the last session of the six. If you made it through all six, congratulations. That's a lot of a training, a lot of complex ideas to wrap the brain around. Uh, we hope you found it informative, uh, and we actually certainly enjoyed bringing it to you. Um, and then one last thing at the end of every session, I say this and I, I couldn't be any more sincere. You know, I've mentioned several times we're doing this amidst the pandemic. We know all of you out there at institutions of higher education, if it's still the middle of 2020 when you're watching this, are also operating amidst the pandemic. Um, and frankly, even if it's after the pandemic and, and things have all hopefully gotten back to at least a new normal. Uh, regardless, we always want to wish you and hope for you that you will be safe and be well. Thanks, everybody.